Hello and welcome to another Algebra 1 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be doing Unit 3, Lesson 9 on more work with domain and range. Alright, so we talked about domain and range primarily back at the beginning of this unit when we first introduced you to the idea of functions. In this lesson, I just want to work a little bit more with domain and range to really hammer home the ideas. We're going to see them more as we go through the course, but it's good to really kind of get some more work with these somewhat complicated ideas. We're going to use a calculator just really once in this lesson, so if you've got kind of a, a handheld or your, 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 your whatever, your scientific or graphing calculator, um, make sure to have it handy. It's just going to be barely in there, but it's kind of nice to have it. So anyway, let's just kind of jump into it and do a little bit of uh, review. You know, functions convert a set of inputs into a set of outputs, and it's important to know which is which. So let's take a look at exercise number one. The domain and ranges are sets, collections of numbers or possibly even non-numbers, but mostly numbers. Fill in each of the following. Letter A, the domain of a function is the set of all blank to the function, and the range of the function is the set of all blank of the function. All right, so what I'd like you to do is see if you can fill in those two blanks. Pause the video now. All right, well, we have talked about domain and range quite a bit at this point, so hopefully you said, ah, the domain of a function is the set of all inputs, right? It's the set of all inputs. I'm going to throw down x values because that's the way a lot of people think about it. It's the set of all inputs or the x values to the function. And the range of a function is the set of all outputs or y values. All right, and that's very important. Now, a lot of times we've been almost kind of ignoring the domain and range. We worked with them pretty extensively in that sort of like first lesson on functions. But besides that, we haven't been paying too much attention to them. Now, before we kind of really get into domain and range, I want to review a little bit about different types of numbers. That's kind of important. In purely mathematical situations, the domain and range of a function are often just like all real numbers or it's, you know, like some kind of subset of all real numbers. But in real world scenarios, the domain and range are oftentimes restricted to particular types of numbers for particular reasons. All right, and that's what we're going to kind of explore a little bit today, but let's talk about these different sets of numbers. Exercise number two. For each of the following sets, list some examples of numbers that lie in the set. All right, so there's, there's three primary sets of numbers that we kind of concern ourselves with. We've got the sets of integers, we've got the, sets of, the set of rational numbers, and then the set of real numbers, right? So the set of integers, let's just kind of like talk about these all together because, you know, the way that we classify numbers is it, it's definitely a very abstract idea for students. And I don't blame anybody, you know, if you're sitting in 8th or ninth grade, you know, and you find this abstract, I get that, right? You know, but the set of integers are just the positive and negative whole numbers, you know, and if all I'm looking for are some examples, then, you know, like negative 8 and, and, and uh, negative 3, uh, 0 is an integer. Um, you know, 4, 10, those are all integers, right? They're all integers. None of them can have fractional parts. None of them can have decimal parts. On the other hand, the set of rational numbers are all the integers along with any kind of ratio of integers, i.e. normal looking fractions. In other words, you know, you could have a rational number is 3 fourths or 5 thirds or 1.8, or negative 3.2. Even whole numbers are, in, are rational numbers because something like the number 5 could be thought of as 5 firsts, or the number negative 3 could be thought of as negative 3 firsts, right? So, you know, all of these things fall into this category. It's not something I need you to be particularly worried about right now, but you know, the idea is that the rational numbers then are, are all of the, the integers plus all of like the kind of the normal fractions that you think about. And finally, the set of real numbers, that's everything. 
Now, unfortunately, eventually you're going to learn in other courses about other numbers called imaginary numbers and complex numbers. But in terms of numbers that people deal with on a regular basis, in terms of the real number line where you shade numbers in, all of those are the real numbers. And they are comprised of the integers, the rational numbers, and then those irritating irrational numbers like pi and like square roots of numbers that aren't perfect squares. So, you know, that, that includes just everything up here. So, you know, you could have negative eight, you could have three fourths, you could have pi, you could have the square root of two. All right. It's everything. Any number that you wrote down here, right, would be an example of a real number unless in some weird way you'd already been exposed to imaginary or complex numbers. Those are super duper cool, but you shouldn't have seen them until you take Algebra 2. Anyhow, let's now dig in a little bit more to domain and range. Okay, it's important to be able to know what types of numbers are included in the domain and the range of a function. Now let's take a look at exercise number three. A function is shown graphed below, parentheses, its equation is y equals 1 half times x squared minus 9. Letter A, why would it be incorrect to describe the domain of this function as all integers from x equals negative 4 to x equals 6? And, and let's, you know, before you try to answer that question, let's be very clear, right, that the function does definitely starts here at x equals negative 4 and definitely ends at 6, so certainly, certainly the domain goes from negative 4 to 6, so why would it be incorrect to describe the domain as, you know, all integers from negative 4 to 6? Pause the video now and see if you can answer this question. All right, well, the plain fact is you can't describe it that way because there's so many more than just the integers, right? Um, the domain includes all real numbers from negative four to six, not just the integers. All right, so it's very important, right? Because this is an unbroken curve, it was, if it was just a bunch of dots and those dots, right, those points were only at integer locations, then that would be exactly the way you'd want to describe it. But it isn't just those, right? Because this curve is nice and continuous, it's got no breaks, it's passing through things like x equals 1 half and x equals pi and x equals all sorts of things. Let's take a look at letter B. Describe the set of numbers that makes up the range of this function. All right, now remember the range is the outputs. So I'd like you to pause the video now and describe for me a set or give me a set in proper notation that gives me the range of this function. Now you have to be a little bit you have to be a little bit careful with just verbal descriptions of ranges and domains. Because you could say something like, well, let's see, the smallest y value, the minimum y value is negative 9, okay? And the maximum y value up here is at positive 9. y max is positive 9. But I'd want to be a little worried about actually doing a kind of description like this. Oh, the range is all real numbers from negative 9 to positive 9. I mean, that's not terrible. Don't get me wrong. The problem with saying things like from this number to this number is it's then a little bit confused, confused, confusing <laughs> about whether or not the negative 9 and the positive 9 are included in the set or not included in the set. Okay, so there's two ways really that we could do this. We could use beautiful interval notation, right? You remember interval notation? That would be a great way of stating the range. Or you could use set builder notation and you could say any real such that negative 9 is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 9, right? 
I would bet that most of you would prefer the interval notation of this only because here you have to write things out a little bit more, you have to make sure you get those like inequalities in the right direction, all of that. All right, one like little final piece and then we'll move on to more range and domain discussion, letter C. Using the graph, estimate the output of the function when the input is x equals pi. Then verify using the equation. All right, well this is kind of cool, right? Like hopefully what you remember about pi, right? Because you've seen that number for a couple of years now, is that a pi is about 3.14, right? It's an irrational number, so its decimal expansion goes on forever without terminating or repeating, okay? But see, if x is equal to this, if you can use that graph to estimate what the y value would be, what the output would be, and then we're gonna use our calculators to see what it is exactly. Pause the video now. That's a little bit challenging, right? Um, you know, if I go over here to something just barely above three, right? And I go down to the graph, it sort of appears that perhaps the output is about negative three and a half, right? So maybe y is about negative 3.5. That's what I would get if I approximated it from the graph, okay? But what the cool thing is, is we actually have the formula, right? I gave you, to that, gave you that right up here, right at the beginning, y equals 1 half x squared minus 9. So let's take a look. y equals 1 half pi squared minus 9. Anytime I'm doing calculations with pi, I want to do them using the pi button on my calculator. All right, so I'm gonna do one half times parentheses. My pi button is down here and I grab it, pi squared minus nine. Enter, thank you so much for giving me exactly what I just put in and I get negative 4.0652. So I wasn't too far off. I wasn't all that close either. I wish I could do that on command, <laughs> but I wasn't that close either. You know, maybe if I kind of scooted in a little bit further, I would have like found a little bit closer to negative four, whereas here I got negative 3.5. Not too bad. I was off by about a half a unit. All right, let's work a little bit more with domain and range. For some functions, the domain and range aren't all real numbers or some continuous subset, right? So in the last ex exercise, we were just looking at this graph, right, that was unbroken in the coordinate plane. So we were able to say, look, the domain was, you know, all real numbers from whatever it was, you know, negative four to positive six, and the range was all real numbers from negative nine to positive nine. But that doesn't always happen. Sometimes the context of the problem limits either the domain or the range or possibly both. Let's take a look at a very good real world example of where that can happen. Exercise number four. A fundraiser is selling raffle tickets for $1.50 each, okay? The amount of money they raise, M, is a function of the number of raffle tickets they sell, N. They can sell at most 50 raffle tickets. Letter A asks to figure out the value of M of 14 and what does it tell you? Right? Hmm. You might be saying, but wait a second, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't give me a formula for the function, right? Except what is M, right? M, the output, is the amount of money we raise. The input is the number of tickets we sold. So M of 14 is basically just telling us, or asking us maybe even, for how much money we make when we sell 14 tickets. Well, that's going to be 14 times 1.50, right? 14 times 1.50, and that gives us m of 14 equals 21. And what does that tell us? We make $21 from selling. 14 tickets. All right, 
Great. Well, hey, let's come up with that formula. Let's take a look at letter B. Write a formula below for the amount of money raised, M, in terms of the number of tickets, N. All right, so now, now I want a formula for my function, and it should be very, very simple, especially given what we did in letter A. Pause the video now and write down a formula for M of N. All right, well, it's pretty simple, right? How do I calculate the amount of money I raise from selling N tickets? I take the price of a single ticket, which is $1.50, and I multiply it by the number of tickets I sell. So there it is. There's my function using function notation, right? That will tell me how much money I raise if I sell N tickets. All right, let's take a look at letter C. Give a description of the domain of this function. Write it in roster form. All right, so remember, the domain are the inputs to the function, right? So what could be the possible inputs to this function? I want you to pause the video now and think very hard about what, what kind of input even goes into this function, and then what are the possible values? Pause the video now. All right, well, here's the key to how to think about this, right? The input to this function is the number of tickets sold. Well, what are the possible values? Well, the, the raffle sale could go horribly, right? And we could sell no tickets at all. So we could certainly have an n value of zero. Now, should I say just all real numbers greater than zero? Well, no, of course not, because I can't sell a half a ticket. I can't sell pi numbers of tickets or the square root of two numbers of tickets, right? So I could certainly sell zero tickets. I could sell one ticket or two tickets or three tickets. So it sounds like, right, it sounds like my domain should be just all integers greater than or equal to zero or all whole numbers greater than or equal to zero. Ah, but that would imply I could sell 437 tickets or 854 tickets. I was told they can sell at most 50 raffle tickets. At most 50 raffle tickets. So I could sell zero, one, two, three, etc., all the way up to 50. And that is my domain, right? My domain is zero, one, two, three. I don't want to have to list them all out, so I put a dot, dot, dot all the way up to 50. And that's my domain, right? Those are all the possible inputs I could possibly have for this function. Let's take a look at letter D. Is the value $10 part of the range of this function? Justify, right? So the range, right, are my outputs to the function, right? And those are amounts of money that I make, like, like when 14 went in as an input, right, which is in this set of inputs, uh, $21 came out as an output. So I know 21 is a member of my range, right? There's no question that 21 is a member of my range. This thing asks, is $10 a member of your range? Pause the video now and play around with this a little bit. All right, well, there's a few ways of doing this problem. One way of doing the problem is start to just list out how much money you'll make from selling zero tickets, one ticket, two tickets, three tickets, etc., and see if 10 is in there, right? And that is a wonderful way of doing this problem. The other way of doing the problem is actually trying to find out how many tickets I would have to sell to make $10, right? And I could figure that out by doing something like this. I could say, well, I'm gonna take 1.50n and I'm gonna set it equal to 10, right? Because that's gonna tell me, well, how many tickets do I have to sell in order to make $10. And if I solve this equation, this beautiful one-step equation, right, by dividing both sides by 1.5 or 1.50, let me see what my calculator tells me. 10 divided by 1.50 gives me 6.6 .6 repeated tickets, right? So, in other words, in order to sell, or in order to have $10 as part of the range, 6.6 .6 repeated would have to be part of the domain, but it's not, right? Therefore, 10 cannot be part of the range. 
Okay, so no, because 6.6 .6 repeated is not part of the domain. Isn't that kind of cool? Right? And it's a really wonderful way of seeing how domain and range are connected to each other. In other words, right, the range is really a product of the domain. All right, we saw that kind of early on when we were working with functions. Sometimes I would give you the domain and I would ask you for what the range was based on the domain, right? So the range is like a response to the domain. And if the domain is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., and yet I would need to sell 6.6 .6 repeated tickets in order to make $10, well, because 6.6 .6 isn't in the domain, 10 can't be in the range. All right. Let's take a look at one more problem. Exercise number five. A smart thermostat warms up a house in the morning over the span of 20 minutes by raising the temperature of the air the furnace releases. The relationship is shown in the graph below. Letter A, what is the temperature of the air coming from the furnace after 12 minutes illustrate on your graph? Okay, well look, letter A is just sort of my way of making sure you can read this graph. So pause the video now and see if you can figure out the temperature of the air coming from the furnace after 12 minutes. Take a moment to do this, it should be pretty quick. All right, well, simple enough, right? I mean, I go over to 12 minutes on my x-axis, I go up on my y-axis, I'm right here, I go over to here, I gotta be a little careful, 65, 66, 67, 68. So I am at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, great. No problem, right? So simple enough. Let's take a look at letter B. Describe the set that represents the domain of this function. Write it using set builder notation. And again, I'm, you know, I'm talking about the inputs. What are the inputs to this function? And again, you can ask yourself, well, like, what kind of numbers? Well, one thing I know for certain, 12 minutes is in the domain, right? 12 minutes must be in the domain because I got an answer out for the range, right? The way you can know whether or not a value is in the domain is, can you put it into the function and get a value out from the range? Right, it's kind of almost the opposite of what we did in that last problem. So pause the video now and see if you can write down what the domain is. And, and at least in this case, I've said, please use set builder notation. So pause the video now. Well, I could certainly put in a time of zero, right? Because it would give me a temperature of 64 degrees. In fact, I can put in any time from zero to 20 and I will get a value for the temperature coming out of the furnace. Any value. I could put in a fractional value, I could put in a whole number value, I could put in an irrational value. So it, it's all real numbers, right? So any real number such that, and maybe I'll use, um, I could use x, that's fine. x is greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to 20. Please notice, right, it's, I can't get anything out here, right, I can't get any negative x's, and I have no idea what's going on after 20, right, there's no line up here that points to the right and off the graph, so I don't know that, okay, but it could be any real number in between 0 and 20. Now, let's take a look at letter C. Is there any time from 0 to 20 minutes when the air coming from the furnace is 65 degrees Fahrenheit? Explain your yes-no answer. So pause the video now, look closely at this graph, and see if you can see any time, you know, between 0 and 20 minutes when the air coming out of the furnace, or, fur, furnace <laughs> is 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, it's kind of easy because you can come over here and you can look at this sort of horizontal line at 65. I'm going to try to get rid of this because it's irrelevant. All right. And if you look at that, there is no part of the graph that ever hits that horizontal line. Right? There's no part of the graph, right? Here we've got a temperature of 64, 64, 64. 
and then it skips over 65 and immediately goes up to 66 and then it skips over 67, hits 68, goes on that for a while, etc. So the answer is no, no, because the temp goes from 64 degrees Fahrenheit to 66 degrees Fahrenheit at five minutes. Right? Skips right over 65. Skips right over it. So, last thing. Letter D. Describe the set that represents the range of this function. You write the set using any proper notation. All right, so what I'd like you to do is write the range of this function. Pause the video now. So this is a little tricky, right? Because the domain was all real numbers from 0 to 20, right? Any x value from 0 to 20 can be put into this function and you will get an output out. But think about what those outputs are. If you put in any time from 0 to 5, your output is going to be 64 degrees. If you put any one in from 5 to 10, your output is going to be 66 degrees. Anything between 10 and 15, your output is going to be 68. And anything between 15 and 20, your output is going to be 70 degrees. So in fact, there's only four outputs to this entire graph, and those four outputs are 64, 66, 68, and 70. And that is this function's range. So it's interesting because here we have a situation where the domain is a set of continuous numbers. Right? Every number from 0 to 20 is in this domain. And yet, the range is actually just a subset of integers, 64, 66, 68, and 70. And that's a little bit weird when we get kind of a mixture between a continuous domain and yet sort of this discontinuous range. All right, let's wrap this up. So today we really just worked more with these kind of sub obscure ideas of domain and range. The domain as its base being the set of all inputs to a particular function, and the range being the set of all outputs for a particular function. All right. You oftentimes will find questions that kind of get into this nuanced thinking about domain and range on standardized tests. So you really want to make sure not only to know, ah, the domain are the x's and the range are the y's, but also how to think about domain and range, especially in applied settings. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another Algebra 1 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.